Okay, so it's always a bit intimidating to speak up to Joan because his work is obviously cutting edge. But um, but I'm very glad to be at a symposium which is called uh, Epidemiology of Information because I actually published a paper on which I entitled Epidemiology of Information or Misinformation about 12 years ago. And that paper, which I also called this field infodemiology, so epidemiology of information or infodemiology. Um, that paper was at, at the time inspired by the discussions around the quality of information on the internet and the concern that people consume dubious uh, health information on the internet and what kind of effect this would have on public health. So I, I thought we really should create kind of a science where we study systematically what people write about, talk about on the internet and use this to somehow understand um, the, the kind of knowledge translation process or where knowledge translation from evidence-based practice guidelines uh, to what people actually do in real life, where, where this knowledge translation process fails or to co kind of quantify the gap between the evidence-based and what, what people do and, and say they do. And um, so that was in 2002. And I also kind of refined this idea by uh, thinking about how we can we use this signal which is out there on the internet somewhere about what people do and what they look for and how we can how can we use this for public health purposes. And that's what, what John mentioned. I published this paper, this very early paper on how searches on the internet can be used as a signal for influenza outbreaks. And that this was long before Google had anything like Google Trends or Google Flu Trends. So I, I had to use some tricks to get to the these kind of data, to search data. But essentially what this paper showed two years before Google actually did this was that there was some sort of correlation and some sort of predictive value of internet searches predicting uh, influenza outbreaks. So again, I call this epidemiology. <coughs> then I, I wrote uh, in 2009 and in 2011 some more yeah, framework papers where, where I basically argued that these are new methods in, uh, for public health. And um, the uh, the underlying idea here is that traditionally you have the cycle of uh, there is some sort of population behavior out there, there's, there's some health status out there in the population, and, and this is measured by traditional epidemiolo epidemiological methods like um, gathering data through uh, polls or uh, from clinics, etc. This, this kind of data is are fed to public health professionals and policy makers. Uh, they change policy or apply public health interventions and these interventions hopefully have some effect on population behavior and health status. And that again is me measured by epidemiological methods. But this is a very slow process. At the same time, the argument is that everything what people do and the attitudes and the health that is somehow reflected by data on the internet. So by tapping into this data and, and developing metrics, which are called epidemiology, um, we can uh, perhaps give a more rapid, provide a more rapid picture to uh, public health professionals and policy makers about what's going on in the, in the population. Now, what I'm going to talk about here uh, in my talk is some analysis we did with uh, Twitter data, with, with tweets, which we mined during the H1N1 uh, outbreak in 2009. So over the past couple of years, we have developed a system which I call InfoVigil, which is a InfoVigil system. It's really meant to be a collaborative platform uh, for also to be used by other researchers 
what the system does is it, it uh, allows researchers to define certain keywords of interest and then we try to collect data from different sources, although due to, due to funding restrictions we really only use Twitter uh, as a data source right now, but basically the system, we, we mine the data and uh, we have some underlying uh, statistical software, R, which is integrated in the system, we have some visualization uh, modules, etc. So this allows us to do uh, research projects rapidly without having to reinvent the wheel about how to mine the data and how to analyze and uh, visualize them. So um, in this example, <coughs> we are using the, uh, the data which we uh, collected during H1N1, about 3 million tweets archived from May 2009 to December 2009. And we did a couple of, of studies um, which give, maybe give you some idea of how, how we can use this data and also what, what the tweets actually contain and how we, can, how, we, how we can use this kind of data. First of all, there was some discussion today about terminology and also how terminology changes during the course of a, a public health event like a pandemic. And this was particularly uh, important and also nice to illustrate during H1N1, which originally, as you know, was referred to as swine flu. And over the course of the pandemic, we were instructed to use H1N1 as the preferred term. So what we did was uh, we collected both tweets which either contain the word swine flu or H1N1. And what you can see here is a plot of the ratio of tweets containing H1N1 versus swine flu. So this is just the proportion of tweets which contain H1N1 over uh, as opposed to swine flu. And you can see during the course of the pandemic, um, there's a shift in terminology from swine flu to uh, H1N1. And I, I find this visualization very, uh, very neat because it illustrates how terminology changes during the course of the pandemic. Um, we can even go so far, and this is not visible in this graph, but we can even see uh, the impact of certain interventions. For example, there has been a social media campa campaign by pig farmers during the H1N1 uh, pandemic, <coughs> where they said, well, stop using swine flu, use the term H1N1. And we can really see how, what the impact of the social media campaign was. Because there was kind of a jump in, in the tweets uh, going from swine flu to H1N1 uh, terminology. What we did uh, as a first step was some manual uh, content analysis of a random sample of, of tweets. And we classified what these tweets were all about. And with Twitter it's important to understand that a very large number of tweets, in our case, about fifty-three percent of tweets were actually quoting or talking about resources, which are actually, in the vast majority of cases, just uh, headlines, like newspaper articles. So people uh, quote the title of a newspaper article and provide a link to this. So this is the kind of uh, content which we refer to as resources as opposed to personal experiences, people tweeting about what happening, what's happening to them. Uh, in our example, 22%. Or personal opinions, 14%. Jokes, 8%. Then spam, 2%. And advertising, 1%. So this is important to keep in mind if you analyze tweets that like about half of the tweets you're analyzing is actually what's written in media and newspapers, etc. Um, we can also we also looked at how the content changed over time, and, and somebody said today that 
1980, and also there was at the beginning there was more humor out there, and this uh, declined. And we, we actually saw the same earlier in the in the pandemic. There were a lot of more jokes in the tweet, uh, and that declined over the time course of the pandemic. Personal experiences increased, etc. So this this kind of graph was based on a manual uh, content analysis of tweets. But we also tried to do some automated uh, analysis. And somebody said today it was very hard for you to classify humoristic newspaper articles. Now in social media it is a bit easier because one thing you can do is just looking at smileys versus frownies. And this is what we did here. We plotted a smiley versus frowny ratio in tweets. And uh, I don't know if you can see this, but in the beginning there were a lot more smileys than frownies. Right? So again, pointing to the fact that in the beginning of the pandemic people were joking a lot. And then around, around October when the pandemic got really bad and there were a lot of dead deaths. Uh, there were a lot more frowning um, We also tried to automatically detect uh, tweets with, with personal experiences, mainly based on, on keywords and, and phrases. And uh, basically what, what these two peaks show that this coincided very well with, with, the, with the two uh, peaks in, in H1N1 incident. So if you if you correlate the tweets of, which contain personal experiences with the H1N1 incidents, there was a pretty uh, amazing correlation. Here. Um, as I said, we, we did we pursued both approaches. We did some manual coding, but we also tried to uh, create all, uh, automated processes to automatically code tweets mainly based on keywords. And this just shows you that um, the, the manual coding and the automatic coding was easier for some categories. For example, if you want to code a, a question, it is easy to do on a, in an automated fashion because all you have to do is looking for a question mark and then it's obvious that, that it contains a question. Uh, it is more difficult in, in to classify other categories. Um, in another study, we looked at vaccination. So we looked at a subset of tweets which contain vaccination-related keywords, and we were trying to code vaccination sentiments. <coughs> so basically, we had a coding framework here uh, with uh, pro-vaccination categories and anti-vaccination categories. So in the first step, we, we tried some manual coding of the subset of Tweets. And we got a plot like this showing that uh, in the beginning there was more anti vaccination uh, sentiment, and then with the vaccination rollout, this uh, kind of uh, shifted. And we saw the same when we, when we tried to automatically code the sentiment that in the beginning there was more anti vaccination uh, sentiment, but when the vaccination rollout started uh, around late October, early November, that picture changed. And um, if you plot, for example, pro-vaccination tweets or also anti-vaccination tweets, you always see these spikes. And these spikes are obviously media uh, reports. So. We can then go back to the tweet and look at what kind of media reports triggered these spikes of pro-vaccination tweets or anti-vaccination tweets. So you can see here some of the media reports which uh, triggered pro-vaccination tweets and some of the media stories which uh, triggered anti-vaccination tweets. And uh, the Last study, which we actually did during the course of the last two years during this project, was to look more at 
the question who's authoring these tweets and wh who are the influencers. Because with, with social media, kind of the, the uh, idea here is to give the little people a voice. Right? And we wanted to see if that's really true, if, if, if really um, widely tweeted and retweeted tweets came from from people who were previously unknown, or whether it was mainly mainstream news media, public health officials, authorities, which were widely retweeted. So we looked at, for example, what the public health officials were doing, uh, who, who the, the public health agencies or the officials who, who tweeted the most, and also um, who, who of the most retweeted accounts overall were. So these are the, the most active public health accounts between H1N1, leading of course the CDC, but then also some other more regional public health agencies. We looked at who tweets what, and I'm not going into detail here. And, um, and we looked also at, as I said, who, who, who were the main influencers which accounts, which tweets from which accounts were the most retweeted tweets. And um, as you can see, um, these are partly news organizations or news aggregators, partly the CDC, but also celebrities. So 55% uh, 55% of the top 20 most retweeted accounts were news and news aggregators, 20% were public health agencies, and then 10% were celebrities. Uh, somebody like Jim Carrey or Phil Murphy uh, tweeting something and that's, that's massively retweeted. Uh, only 10% alternative health and 5% from entertainment sources. And we didn't find a single instance where there was uh, kind of what I would call the, the little man's voice being massively rebroadcast. So it's all really the more traditional uh, news media, traditional authorities, and celebrities, which kind of stresses the role of, which, of celebrities during a uh, outbreak uh, to change public behavior. So that's uh, just uh, to give you a quick flavor of what kind of research we can do with tweets. And um, the website I mentioned, InfoVigil, is available under infobiology.org.